everybody in the room. This is exciting to see such a full uh, room for today's Living Writers Lecture. Uh, my name is Tim Mansfield. I'm Colgate's Director of Alumni Affairs. And a warm welcome to you, alumni that are, that are in the room joining us here, and those of which are online watching. Um, I wanted to give a few remarks before we open up, and I turn the floor over to um, Professor Pynchon. Um, I do want to welcome a new audience that's online. Uh, for students, um, I want to let you know what we've been doing the last few weeks is we've been sending an email out to former English majors, uh, folks who've been involved in our uh, summer reading program, really a targeted audience that would really appreciate a program like Living Writers. And we've done that every week to remind folks about this great opportunity to participate online. This week, we decided to send it out to all of our alumni included in, in a, an email newsletter. So today, we're expecting a much wider population of people who may not have been English majors or exposed to this invitation before. So a warm welcome to anybody who's online that has not yet joined us for one of these uh, Living Writers lectures. Um, in case there are folks that do not know, we do have two cameras in the room. And like I said, we do have a microphone that I'll need to pass on to our speakers up front. We use this uh, so folks at, at home can hear us. Uh, this microphone is for the room here. So pardon the exchange of microphones, but it's important we use these. Um, I did get a good question about are we archiving and saving all the good lectures that we've had already? And the answer is yes, we are. Um, it's important that folks who are working or at home that really want to participate in these kinds of uh, lectures have a chance to do so, even if they want to watch later. So we are storing them, and we'll be able to put them all together on one uh, landing page, which we'll be putting information out about shortly. Um, I do invite, um, it may be implied, but I hope folks online do engage with each other, dialogue in the chat session uh, that's alongside the, uh, the viewing screen, and also can lob in a question. Um, we, uh, the folks in the room and our author are interested in hearing about what your thoughts are about the book or the conversation that we're sharing in the room. So feel free to put in a question to Lori and I, and we'll be, uh, as time allows, we'll be introducing them here in the room. Um, and lastly, uh, we are doing something, again, different tomorrow. What we're going to offer tomorrow during lunch um, is a more uh, smaller, intimate discussion um, with Elizabeth Strout uh, during lunch. So from 12 to 1, uh, I think we're going to have two graduate students, the professors, uh, Ms. Strout and myself, in more of a living room, intimate discussion on the book and, and her career. And I think that'll be a, um, an exciting opportunity to be a part of something unique and different. So feel free to jump in online um, if you're interested in being a part of that tomorrow, Friday at 12 noon on the same online channel that you have here. Um, folks, if, you, if you're comfortable on the floor, that's great. There are some ski, seats scattered about, so feel free to use those if you'd like to, or if you're comfortable there, that's fine, but we do have some seats still available uh, in the room. Yes? Nice idea. Why don't we take a minute so folks can find a spot while it's, we have a minute before we get started. So if anybody who would like to get a seat, please feel, feel free now to grab a spot uh, in one of those seats now. Okay, great. It looks like most people are comfortable now. Um, a few last, uh, last remarks. A uh, few last remarks. Um, for the students that are in the room, I've, I, I and others have thanked you before, and to our professors, um, a genuine thank you to you all. Um, for our guests that are in the room from the Colgate, Hamilton, and community beyond, this is a, a, a thanks from all of them to you for allowing us into this class and this kind of opportunity. Um, I say that genuinely and I really mean it because we are getting some great feedback from folks that are online and really excited to be part of this class in a way that they remember very fondly at Colgate. Um, so again, a thanks on behalf of a lot of people that are watching and contributing. Um, in case folks don't know, this online opportunity we've had, we've had some exciting feedback from folks that have been watching internationally um, online. We have some prospective students that have watched and contributed, um, current Colgate students. I think we had one 
uh, one week over in the library that was watching online and, and sent in a question. Um, so it's been fun and exciting and a new way to bring uh, classes to a different population. Uh, with that, I do want to introduce uh, Professor Jane Pynchon and my thanks to both Jennifer Bryce and Jane Pynchon for again allowing us here. Professor Pynchon. Many of you in this audience know Elizabeth Strout as the author of two best-selling books, the 1999 first novel with an enormous readership, Amy and Isabel, and Abide With Me, again earning both critical and popular acclaim, this time in 2006. And now the new collection of stories that we are reading in Living Writers this semester, a collection that has, as you all know, won the 2009 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, a beautiful book. And because we are in the very year 2009, might we stop for a moment and wildly applaud that achievement. Liz Strout is also the winner of the Los Angeles Times Arts Seinenbaum Award for First Fiction, the Chicago Tribune Heartland Prize, and she has been a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award and the Orange Prize in England. Born in Portland, Maine, of a family with eight generations in place, educated at Bates College, where she majored in English, and at Syracuse University College of Law, about which she says, and never wavers, I was a terrible lawyer. <laughs> Liz has also taught at Colgate and teaches for the MFA program at Queens University in Charlotte, North Carolina. She lives in New York City. They are books that, once read, cannot be subtracted from yourself the works of Elizabeth Strout. Amy and Isabel abide with me, Olive Kittredge. Set in small, tough New England towns with names like Shirley Falls, Crosby, and West Annette, the inland reaches of northern New England with its quick hot summers and long dark winters had bred for generations a way of life that had at, at its center the need to endure. Towns with choruses of people whose lives are hard as lives are, filled with betrayal and small gifts, unexpected generosities, not least of which is the bond Strout forges between her reader and her characters, across place and time and class and age. Amy and Isabel and Abide With Me are large works bent on exploring loving kindness and loneliness, and also exploring the ways in which groups of people, communities, work to sustain individuals to pry them out of despair. Olive Kittredge, a novel in stories, Olive's stories, is of course the newest of Liz Strout's published works linked by characters who walk in and out of each other's lives and literally in and out of each other's stories, by a main town that, in its 21st century iteration, has all but lost its power to hold or heal. By water, by gossip, and by olive, the book is a joy to read and, and to read about, reviewed and admired enormously in, for example, the New York Times book review, where it is described as a new form managing to combine the sustained, messy investigation of the novel with the flashing insight of the short story. Still, I must say, I like better what Nora Ephron wrote 
I was in the middle of reading Elizabeth Strout's Olive Kittredge the day Strout won the Pulitzer Prize. And I almost felt I'd won a prize too. <laughs> this is a magical, powerful book. 13 stories linked by a completely problematic, prickly, complicated woman named Olive Kittredge. I loved it so much that when I finished reading it, I started at the beginning and read it over again. Exactly. A personal and at the same time oddly institutional note. Elizabeth Strout did us proud as a teacher in Colgate's creative writing program and English department. As seniors from her 2007 class made clear at lunch today. And she is every bit as much a joy to know as to read and that given her works before us, is quite something. Please join me, Jennifer Bryce, Peter Balakian, and Patrick O'Keefe, and the whole of the Department of English in welcoming back Elizabeth Strout. Such a nice Thank you so much. Um, that was lovely, Jane. It's, it's nice to be here. And um, I'm just going to start reading. Um, although it was wonderful to see some of, of my former students. I don't want to forget to say that. I'm going to read from the story Tulips. These stories tend to be too long to read the entire thing. But um, we'll start. Tulips. People thought the Larkin couple would move after what happened. But they didn't move. Perhaps they had nowhere to go. Their blinds remained drawn, however, day and night. Although sometimes in the dusk of winter, Roger Larkin would be found shoveling his driveway. Or in the summer, after the grass got high and sad looking, you might find him out mowing the lawn. In both cases, he wore a hat far down over his face and never looked up when someone drove by. Louise, there was never any sight of at all. Apparently, she'd been in a hospital down in Boston for a while. The daughter lived near Boston, so that would make sense. But Mary Blackwell, who was an x-ray technician in Portland, said Louise had spent time in the hospital there. What was interesting was that Mary was criticized for reporting this, even though at the time there wasn't a soul in town who wouldn't have chopped off a baby finger for news of any kind. But there was that small outpouring against Mary. With the HIPAA privacy laws these days, she could have lost her job, people said. Remind me never to have shock treatments in Portland, people said. <laughs> and Cecil Green, who brought hot coffee and donuts to the reporters who hung around the house those days, took a scolding from Olive Kittredge. What in hell ails you, Olive demanded over the phone, feeding the vultures like that. Good God. But Cecil was known to be a little slow, and Henry Kittredge asked his wife to leave the fellow alone. How the Larkins got groceries, nobody knew. It was assumed the daughter from Boston must have some hand in getting her parents food because once a month or so, there would be a car parked in the driveway with a Massachusetts license plate. And while she was never seen in the local grocery store, perhaps she brought with her her husband, whom nobody in the town of Crosby would recognize anymore. And maybe he did some shopping in Mardenville. Had the Larkins stopped going to visit their son? Nobody knew, and after a while, people did not talk too much about it. Sometimes people driving past the house, large and square, square painted pale yellow, even turned their heads away, not wanting to be reminded of what could happen to a family that had seemed as pretty and fresh as blueberry pie. It was Henry Kittredge responding in the middle of the night to a police call that the alarm in his pharmacy had gone off, a raccoon had made its way inside, who saw the Larkins pulling out of their driveway, Roger driving, Louise, presumably Louise, for the woman had a scarf around her head and was wearing dark glasses, sitting motionless beside him. It was two o'clock in the morning, and that's when Henry understood that this couple came and went under cover of night that most likely, most certainly, they would drive to Connecticut to visit the son. But they did it with a furtiveness, and he thought perhaps they would always live this way. He told all of this, and she said, yikes, softly. 
In any event, the Larkins and their home and whatever their story was inside it eventually receded so that their house with its drawn shades took on over time the nature of one more hillock in the dramatic rise and fall of the coastal landscape. The natural rubber band around people's lives, the curiosity stretched for a while, had long ago returned to encompass their own particularities. Two, five, then seven years passed by, and in the case of Olive Kittredge, she found herself positively squeezed to death by an unendurable sense of loneliness. Her son, Christopher, had married. Olive and Henry had been appalled by the bossiness of their new daughter-in-law, who had grown up in Philadelphia and who expected things like a diamond tennis bracelet for Christmas. What was a tennis bracelet? But Christopher bought her one. And who would send back meals in a restaurant, one time demanding the chef be brought to speak to her. Olive, suffering a seemingly endless menopause, would be washed over with extraordinary waves of heat in the girl's presence. And one time Suzanne said, there's a soy supplement you could take, Olive, if you don't believe in estrogen replacement. <laughs> Olive thought, I believe in minding my own business. That's what I believe in. <laughs> she said, I've got to get the tulips in before the ground freezes. Oh, asked Suzanne, who had proven to be consistently stupid about flowers. Do you plant those tulips every year? Certainly, said Olive. Um, oh, said Suzanne, who had proven to be consistently stupid about flowers. Do you plant those tulips every year? Certainly, said Olive. I'm sure my mother didn't plant them every year, and we always had some in the back of the house. <coughs> I think if you ask your mother, Olive said, you'll find you're mistaken. The bloom of a tulip is already in its bulb, right there, one shot, that's it. The girl smiled in a way that made Olive want to slap her. <laughs> At home, Henry said, don't go telling Suzanne she's mistaken. Oh, hell, said Olive, I'll tell her anything I want. But she made some applesauce and took it over to their house. The couple hadn't been married four months when Christopher called from work one day. Now listen, he said, Suzanne and I are moving to California. For Olive, everything turned upside down. It was as though she'd been thinking, this is a tree, and here is a kitchen stove. And it wasn't a tree at all, or a kitchen stove either. When she saw the for sale sign in front of the house she and Henry had built for Christopher, it was as though splinters of wood were shoved into her heart. She wept at times with such noise the dog whimpered and trembled and pushed his cold nose into her arm. She screamed at the dog. She screamed at Henry. I wish she'd drop dead, Olive said. Just drop dead today. And Henry didn't admonish her. California? Why all the way across this vast country? I like sunshine, Suzanne said. New England autumns are fine for about two weeks and then the darkness settles in and... She smiled, lifting a shoulder. I just don't like it, that's all. You'll come visit us soon. It was hard stuff to swallow. Henry, by then, had retired from the pharmacy. Earlier than planned, the rent had skyrocketed and the building was sold for a big chain drugstore to move in, and he often seemed at a loss for how to fill his days. Olive, who had retired from teaching five years earlier, kept telling him, get yourself a schedule and stick to it. So Henry took a woodworking class at the Extension School in Portland and set up a lathe in the basement, eventually producing four uneven but quite lovely maple salad bowls. Olive poured over catalogs and ordered 100 tulip bulbs. They joined the American Civil War Society. Henry's great-grandfather had been at Gettysburg and they had the old pistol in the hutch to prove it, driving up to Belfast once a month to sit in a circle and hear lectures about battles and heroes and so forth. They found it interesting. It helped. They chatted with the other Civil War people, then drove home in the dark, passing the Larkin house, where no lights were on. Olive shook her head. I've always thought Louise was a little off, she said. Louise had been a guidance counselor at the school Olive taught in, and there was something about Louise. She would talk too much and too gaily, and wore all that makeup and put such a fuss into her clothes. She got absolutely tipsy at the Christmas parties, Olive said. One year downright drunk, I found her singing Onward Christian Soldiers sitting on the bleachers in the gym. Honestly, it was disgusting. <laughs> well, said Henry. Yes, agreed Olive. Well, indeed. And so they were getting on their feet. 
Olive and Henry, finding their way in this retirement land when Christopher telephoned one night to say calmly that he was getting divorced. Henry was on the phone in the bedroom, Olive on the phone in the kitchen. But why, they asked in unison. She wants to, Christopher said. But what happened, Christopher? For God's sake, you've only been married a year. Mom, it's happened, that's all. Well, then come on home, son, Henry said. No, Christopher answered, I like it out here. And the practice is going well. I have no intention of coming back home. Henry spent the evening sitting in the living room with his head in his hands. Come on, snap out of it, Olive said. At least you're not Roger Larkin, for God's sake. But her hands were trembling, and she went and took everything out of the refrigerator and cleaned the inside and the racks with a sponge that she dipped into a bowl of cool water and baking soda. Then she put everything back into the refrigerator. Henry was still sitting with his head in his hands. More and more often, Henry sat in the living room with his head in his hands. One day, he said with sudden cheerfulness, he'll come back, you'll see. And what makes you so sure? It's his home, Olive. This coastline is his home. As though to prove the strength of this geographical pull on their only offspring, they trace their genealogy, driving to, driving to Augusta to work in the library there, going to old graveyards miles away. Henry's ancestors went back eight generations, Olive's went back ten. Her first ancestor had come from Scotland, was indentured for seven years of labor, and then started out on his own. The Scottish were scrappy and tough, surviving things you'd never dream of, scalpings, freezing winters with no food, barns burning from a lightning flash, children dying left and right, but they persevered, and Olive would be temporarily lightened in spirit as she read about this. Still, Christopher remained gone. Fine, he would say when they called him, fine. But who was he, this stranger living in California? No, not right now, he said, when they wanted to fly out to visit. Now isn't a good time. All of the trouble sitting still. Instead of a lump in her throat, she felt a lump in her whole body, a persistent ache that seemed to be holding back enough tears to fill the bay seen through the front window. She was flooded with images of Christopher. As a toddler, he had reached to touch a geranium on the windowsill, and she had slapped his hand. But she had loved him. By God, she had loved him. In second grade, he had almost set himself on fire, trying to burn his spelling test out back in the woods. But he knew she loved him. People know exactly who loves them and how much. Olive believed this. Why would he not allow his parents to even visit him? What, what had they done? She could make the beds, do the laundry, feed the dog, but she could not be bothered anymore with meals. What shall we have for supper, Henry would ask, coming upstairs from the basement. Strawberries. Henry would chide her. You wouldn't last a day without me, Olive. If I died tomorrow, whatever would become of you? Oh, stop it. It irritated her, that kind of thing, and it seemed to her that Henry enjoyed irritating her. Sometimes she'd get into the car by herself and go for a drive. It was Henry who bought the groceries now. One day he brought back with him a bunch of flowers. For my wife, he said, handing them to her. They were the saddest damn things. Daisies dyed blue among the white and ludicrously pink ones, some of them half dead. Put them in that pot, Olive said, pointing to an old blue vase. The flowers sat there on the wooden table in the kitchen. Henry came and put his arms around her. It was early autumn and chilly, and his woolen shirt smelled faintly of wood chips and mustiness. She stood, waiting for the hug to end. Then she went outside and planted her tulip bulbs. A week later, just a morning with errands to do, they drove into town, into the parking lot of the big shop and save. Olive was going to stay in the car and read the paper while he went in to get the milk and orange juice and a jar of jam. Anything else? He said those words. Olive shook her head. Henry opened the door, swinging his long legs out. The creak of the opening car door, the back of his plaid jacket, then the bizarre, unnatural motion of him falling right from that position to the ground. Henry, she shouted. She shouted at him, waiting for the ambulance to come. His mouth moved and his eyes were open, and one hand kept jerking through the air as though reaching for something beyond her. The tulips bloomed in ridiculous splendor. The mid-afternoon sun hit them in a wide wash of light where they grew on the hill, almost down to the water. From the kitchen window, Olive could see them, yellow, white, pink, bright red, she had planted them at different depths, and they had a lovely unevenness to them. 
When a breeze bent them slightly, it seemed like an underwater field of something magical, all those colors floating out there. Even lying in the bump-out room, the room Henry had added a few years before, with a bay window big enough to have a small bed tucked right under it, she could see the tops of the tulips, the sun hitting the blooms, and sometimes she dozed briefly, listening to the transistor radio she held to her ear whenever she lay down. She got tired this time of day because she was up so early before the sun. The sky would just be lightening as she got into her car with the dog and drove to the river, where she walked the three miles one way and the three miles back on the, as the sun rose over the wide ribbon of water where her ancestors had paddled their canoes from one inlet to another. The walkway had been newly paved, and by the time Olive made her way back, rollerbladers would be passing by, young and ferociously healthy, their spandex thighs pumping past her. She'd drive to Dunkin' Donuts and read the paper and give the dog some donut holes, and then she would drive to the nursing home. Mary Blackwell was working there now. Olive might have said, hope you've learned to keep your mouth shut, because Mary looked at her oddly. But Mary Blackwell could go to hell. They all could go to hell. Propped up in his wheelchair, blind, always smiling, Henry was wheeled by Olive to the recreation room over by the piano. She said, squeeze my hand if you understand me. But his hand did not squeeze her hand. Blink, she said, if you hear me. He smiled straight ahead. In the evening, she went back to spoon the food into his mouth. They let her wheel him into the parking lot one day so the dog could lick his hand. Henry smiled. Christopher is coming, she told him. When Christopher arrived, Henry still smiled. Christopher had gained weight, and he wore a collared shirt to the nursing home. When he saw his father, he looked at Olive with a face stricken. Talk to him, Olive directed. Tell him you're here. She walked away so they could have some privacy, but it wasn't long before Christopher came to find her. Where have you been, he asked peevishly, but his eyes were red and Olive's heart unfolded. Are you eating all right out there in California, she asked. My God, how can you stand this place, her son asked. I can't, she said. The smell stays all over you. She was like some helpless schoolgirl, careful not to let it show how glad she was to have him there, not to have to go there alone, to have him in the car beside her. But he did not stay the whole week. He said something had come up at work and he had to get back. All right, then. She drove him to the airport with the dog in the back seat. The house was emptier than ever. Even the nursing home seemed changed with Christopher not being there. The next morning, she wheeled Henry over by the piano. Christopher will be back soon, she said. He had some work to finish up, but he's coming back soon. He's crazy about you, Henry. He kept saying what a wonderful father you were. But her voice started to wobble, and she had to move away, looking out the window at the parking lot. She didn't have a Kleenex and turned to find one. Mary Blackwell stood there. What's the matter, Olive said to her. Haven't you seen, ever seen an old lady cry before? <coughs> She didn't like to be alone. Even more, she didn't like being with people. It made her skin crawl to sit in Daisy Foster's tiny dining room, sipping tea. I went to that damn dopey group, grief group, she told Daisy, and they said it was normal to feel angry. God, people are stupid. Why in hell should I feel angry? We all know this stuff is coming. Not many are lucky enough to just drop dead in their sleep. People react in their own way, I guess, Daisy said in her nice voice. She didn't have anything except a nice voice, Olive thought, because that's what Daisy was, nice. To hell with all of it. She said the dog was waiting and left her teacup still full. It was like that. She couldn't stand anyone. She went to the post office every few days, and she couldn't stand that either. How are you doing, Emily Buck asked her every time, and it annoyed Olive. I'm managing, Olive said, but she hated getting the envelopes, almost all with Henry's names name and the bills. She didn't know what to do with them, didn't even understand some of them in so much junk mail. She'd stand by the big gray waste bin throwing it all away and sometimes a bill would get tossed in and she'd have to lean in and fiddle around to find it, all the while aware of Emily watching her from behind the counter. A few cards dribbled in. I'm sorry, so sad. I'm sorry to hear. She answered each one. Don't be sorry, she wrote. We all know this stuff is bound to happen. There's not a damn thing to be sorry about. Only once or twice, fleetingly, did it occur to Olive that she might be out of her head. Christopher called once a week. What can I do for you, Christopher, she'd ask, meaning do something for me. 
Shall I fly out and visit you? No, he always said. I'm doing all right. The tulips died, the trees turned red, the leaves fell off, the trees were bare, snow came. All these changes she watched from the bump-out room where she lay on her side, clutching her transistor radio, her knees tucked to her chest. The sky was black against the long panes. She could see three tiny stars. On the radio, a man's calm voice interviewed people or reported news. When the words seemed to shift in meaning, she knew she had slept for a bit. Yikes, she said softly, at times. She thought about Christopher, why he would not let her come visit, why he did not come back east. Her mind briefly passed over the Larkins, wondering if they still visited their son. Perhaps Christopher stayed in California hoping to reconcile with his wife. What a fierce know-it-all Suzanne had been, and yet she hadn't known a damn thing about any flower that grew up out of the earth. One freezing cold morning, Olive took her walk, went to Dunkin' Donuts, read the paper in the car while the dog in the back seat kept whining. Hush, she said, stop it. The dog's whimpering became louder. Stop it, she shouted. She drove. She drove to the library and didn't go in. And she drove to the post office, tossed some junk mail into the waste bin, and then had to bend over and fish out a pale yellow envelope with no return address, the handwriting not one she recognized. In the car, she ripped it open, just a plain yellow square. He was always a nice man, and I'm sure he still is. Signed, Louise Larkin. The next morning, while it was still dark, Olive drove by the Larkin house slowly. There, beneath the blind, was the faintest strip of light. Christopher, she said into the phone, kitchen phone the next Saturday, Louise Larkin sent me a note about your father. She heard nothing. Are you still there, she asked. Still here, Christopher said. Did you hear what I said about Louise? Yep. Don't you think that's interesting? Not really. Pain, like a pine cone unfolding, seemed to blossom beneath her breastbone. I don't even know how she found out, Olive said, shut up in the house all day. Dunno, Christopher said. All right, then, Olive said. Well, I'm off to the library. Goodbye. She sat at the kitchen table, leaning forward, her head on her big stump, her hand on her big stomach. The thought that she could, any time she needed to, kill herself went through her head. It was not the first time in her life that she'd thought this, but before, she would think about the note to leave. Now she thought she would leave no note, not even Christopher. What did I do that you should treat me this way? <coughs> She looked with some caution around the kitchen. There were women, widows, who hated to give up their home, died soon after someone hauled them off to assisted living. But she didn't know how much longer she could go on living here. She had been waiting to see if there was some way Henry could finally come home. She had been waiting for Christopher to come back east. As she stood up looking for her car keys, because she had to get out of here, she remembered in a distant way how as a much younger woman she had felt the dreariness of domestic life yelling while Christopher ducked his head, I hate being a goddamn slave. Maybe she hadn't yelled that. She called to the dog and left. Absolutely stick thin and appearing ancient in the way she moved, Louise led Olive into the darkened living room. Louise turned on a lamp and Olive was surprised by the beauty in the woman's face. Don't mean to stare, Olive said. She had to say this because she knew she was not going to be able to stop staring. But you look lovely. Do I? Louise made a sound of soft laughter. Your face. Ah. It was as though all of Louise's earlier attempts to be pretty, her dyed blonde hair, her heavy pink lipstick, her eagerness of speech and careful clothing, the beads and bracelets and nice shoes, Olive remembered. All of this had, in fact, been covering up the essence of Louise, who, stripped by grief and isolation and probably drugged to the gills, emerged in her frailty with a face of astonishing beauty. You seldom saw really beautiful old women, Olive thought. You saw the remnants of it, if there had once been that way, but you seldom saw what she saw now, the brown eyes that shone with an otherworldliness, sunken behind a bone structure as fine as any sculpture, the skin drawn tight across the cheekbones, the lips still full, her hair white and tied off to the side in a little brown ribbon. I've made tea, Louise said. No, but thank you. All right, then. Louise sat down gracefully in a chair nearby. She was wearing a long, dark, green, uh, green sweater-type robe. Cashmere, Olive realized. The Larkins were the only people in town with money they spent. 
The kids had gone to private school in Portland. They'd had tennis lessons and music lessons and skating lessons, and each summer had gone away to summer camp. People used to laugh about that because no other kid in Crosby, Maine went to summer camp. There were summer camps nearby filled with kids from New York, and why would the Larkins have their children spend the summer with them? It's how they were, is all. Roger's suits, Olive remembered, had been made by a tailor, or so Louise used to say. Later, of course, people assumed they must have gone broke. But maybe there weren't that many expenses once all the experts got paid. Olive looked around discreetly. The wallpaper had water stains in one spot and the wainscoting was faded. It was clean, the room, but not one speck of effort had been given to maintaining it. Olive had not been here for ages. Perhaps a Christmas tea it had been. A Christmas tree in that corner, lit candles and food all over the place. Louise greeting people. Louise had always liked to be present a good show. It doesn't bother you staying in this house, Olive asked. Staying anywhere bothers me, Louise answered. To actually pack up and move, well, that always seemed too much. I guess I can see that. Roger lives upstairs, Louise said, and I live downstairs. Huh. Olive was having trouble taking things in. Arrangements get made in life. Accommodations get made. Olive nodded. What she minded was how Henry had bought her those flowers, how she just stood there. She'd kept the flowers, dried them out, all the blue daisies brown now, bent over. Has Christopher been a help to you? Louise asked. He was always such a sensitive boy, wasn't he? Louise smoothed her bony hand over her cashmere-covered knee. But then, Henry was a nice man, so that was lucky for you. Olive didn't answer. Through the bottom of the drawn blind, a thin strip of white light shone. It was morning now. She'd be on her walk with the river if she hadn't come, by the river if she hadn't come here. Louise said, Roger is not a nice man, you see, and that made all the difference. Olive looked back at Louise. He always seemed nice enough to me. In truth, Olive didn't remember much about Roger. He had looked like a banker, which he was, and his suits had fit well, if you cared about that kind of thing, and Olive did not. He seemed nice to everyone, Louise said. That's his modus operandi, she laughed lightly. But in reality, she spoke with exaggerated enunciation, his heart beats twice an hour. <laughs> Olive sat completely still, her big, bag, her big handbag on her lap. Cold, cold man. <laughs> but no one cares because they blame the mother, you know. Always, always, always they blame the mother for everything. I suppose that's true, said Olive. You know that's true. Please, Olive, make yourself comfortable. Louise waved a thin white hand, a strip of poured milk in the dim light. Olive tentatively moved her handbag to the floor, sat back. Louise folded her hands and smiled. Christopher was a sensitive boy, just like Doyle. Nobody believes this now, of course, but Doyle is the sweetest man alive. Olive nodded, turned around and looked behind her. Twenty-nine times, the newspapers had kept reporting, and on the TV, too, twenty-nine times. That was a lot. Maybe you don't like my comparing Doyle to Christopher. Louise laughed lightly again, her tone almost flirtatious. How's your daughter, asked Olive, looking, turning back to face Louise. What's she up to these days? She lives in Boston, married to a lawyer, which has been helpful, naturally. She's a wonderful woman. Olive nodded. Louise leaned forward, both hands on her lap. She tilted her head back and forth and chanted softly, boys go to Jupiter to get more stupider, go, girls go to college to get more knowledge. She laughed her soft laugh and sat back. Roger ran right off to his lady friend in Bangor. Again, the soft laugh, but she rejected him, poor thing. For Olive, there was more than an inner silent groan of disappointment. There was an almost desperate urge to leave, and yet she could not, of course, having trespassed having written Louise back, having asked to visit. You've probably thought of killing yourself, Louise said this serenely, as though discussing a recipe for lemon pie. Olive felt a sudden disorientation, as though a soccer ball had just been bounced off her head. I hardly see that would solve anything, she said. <coughs> of course it would, Louise said pleasantly. It would solve everything. But there's the question of how to do it. Olive shifted her weight, touched her handbag that was next to her, Myself, of course, it would be pills and drink. You, I don't see you as a pill person, something more aggressive. The wrists, but that would take so long. I guess that's enough of that, said Olive. But she couldn't help adding, there are people who depend on me, for heaven's sakes. 
Exactly. Louise held up a bony finger, tilted her head. Doyle lives for me, so I live for him. I write him every day. I visit every chance it's allowed. He knows he's not alone, and so I stay alive. Olive nodded. But surely Christopher doesn't depend on you. He has a wife. She divorced him, Olive said. It was odd how easy it was to say this. The truth was that she and Henry had never told anyone except their friends up the river, Bill and Bunny Newton. With Christopher in California, it didn't seem anyone needed to know. I see, said Louise. Well, I'm sure he'll find a new one. And Henry doesn't depend on you, dear. He doesn't know where he is or who is with him. Olive felt a shoot of fury stab through her. How do you know that? It's not true. He knows damn well I'm there. Oh, I don't think so. That's not what Mary says. <laughs> Mary who? Louise put her fingers to her mouth in an exaggerated manner. Whoops! <laughs> Mary Blackwell? You're in touch with Mary Blackwell? Olive said. Mary and I go way back, Louise explained. Yeah. Well, she told everyone things about you, too. Olive's heart had started to beat fast. And I imagine every one of them was true. Louise laughed that soft laugh and made a gesture as though she were drying nail polish. She shouldn't be telling things from the nursing home. Oh, come now, Olive. People are people. It always seemed to me that you especially understood that. A silence came into the room, like dark gases coming from the corners. There were no newspapers or magazines or any books. What do you do all day? Olive asked. How do you manage? Ah, said Louise. Have you come here for lessons? No, said Olive. I came because you were nice enough to write me a note. I was always sorry my kids didn't have you for a teacher. So many people don't have that spark, do they, Olive? Are you sure you wouldn't like that tea? I'm going to have some. No, I'm fine. Olive watched as Louise stood and moved through the room. Louise bent to straighten a lampshade, and the sweater fell across her back, showing the thin form of it. Olive didn't know what could be, you could be that thin and still be alive. Are you ill, she asked, when Louise returned with a teacup on a saucer. Ill? Louise smiled in that way that reminded Olive once again of flirtation. In what way ill, Olive? Physically, you're very thin, but you certainly do look beautiful. Louise spoke carefully, but again with that playful tone. Physically ill, I am not, though I have little appetite for food, if that's what you're referring to. Olive nodded. If she had asked for tea, she'd have been able to leave when she'd finished it, but it was too late now. She sat. And mentally, I don't believe really that I am one bit more out of my head than any other creature here on earth. Louise sipped her tea. The veins on her hand were pronounced. One went right down her skinny finger. The teacup clattered just slightly against the saucer. Has Christopher been out here frequently to help you, Olive? Oh, sure, sure he has. Louise pursed her lips, tilted her head again, studied Olive. And Olive could see now that the woman was wearing makeup. Around her eyes was a shadowing of color that matched her sweater. Why did you come here, Olive? I told you because you were nice enough to send that note. But I've disappointed you, haven't I? Certainly not. You're the last person I expect to lie, Olive. Olive reached down for her handbag. I'm going to get going, but I do appreciate you, that you sent the note. Oh, said Louise, laughing softly. You came here for a nice dose of schadenfreude, and it didn't work. She sang, sorry. Overhead, Olive heard the floorboards creak. She stood, holding her bag, looking for her coat. Roger is up. Louise continued her smile. Your coat is in the closet right as you came in. And I happen to know that Christopher has been back only once. Liar, liar, Olive. Pants on fire, Olive. Olive went as fast as she could. She had the coat over her shoulder and turned back briefly. Louise was sitting in her chair, her thin back straight, her face so oddly beautiful. She was no longer smiling. She said to Olive loudly, she was a bitch, you know, a slut. Who? Louise just stared at her with stony beauty. A shiver ran right through Olive. Louise said, she was. Oh, she was something, let me tell you, Olive Kittredge. A cock tease. I don't care what the paper said about how she loved animals and small children. She was evil, a living monster brought into this world to make a sweet boy crazy. Okay, okay, Olive was putting her coat on hurriedly. She deserved it, you know, she did. Olive turned and saw Roger Larkin on the stairs behind her. He looked old and wore a loose sweater, but he had slip and he had slippers on. Olive said, I'm sorry, I've disturbed her. He only raised a hand tiredly, the gesture indicating that she was not to worry. Life had brought them to this point, and he was resigned to living in hell. 
This is what Olive thought she saw as she hurried to get her coat. Roger Larkin opened the door, nodding slightly, and as the door was closing behind her, Olive was certain she heard the tiny, quick smashing sound of glass and the spat-out word, cunt. A bright haze hung over the river, so you could barely make out the water. You couldn't even see too far ahead on the path, and Olive was consistently startled by the people who passed by her. She was here later than usual, and more people were out and about. Next to the asphalt pathway, the patches of pine needles were visible, and the fringe of tall grasses, and the bark of the shrub oaks, and the granite bench to sit on. A young man ran toward her, emerging through the light fog. He was pushing before him a triangular-shaped stroller on wheels, the handles like those of a bicycle. Olive caught sight of a sleeping baby tucked inside. What contraptions they had these days, these self-important baby boomer parents. When Christopher was the age of that baby, she'd leave him napping in his crib and go down the road to visit Betty Sims, who had five kids of her own. They'd be crawling all over the house and all over Betty like slugs stuck to her. Sometimes when Olive got back, Chris would be awake and whimpering, but the dog Sparky knew how to watch over him. Olive walked quickly. It was unseasonably hot, and the haze was warm and sticky. She felt the sweat run from her below her eyes like tears. The visit to the Larkin home sat inside her like a dark, messy injection of sludge spreading throughout her body. Only telling someone about it would get it hosed out. But it was too early to call Bunny, and not having Henry, the walking, talking Henry, to tell this to grieved her so much that it was as though she had just that morning lost him to his stroke again. She could picture clearly what Henry would say, always that gentle amazement, my word, he'd say softly, my word. On your left, yelled someone, and a bicycle whizzed past her, coming so close she felt the whir of an air on her hand. Jesus, lady, said the helmeted alien as he sped by, and confusion rolled through Olive. You're supposed to stay on the right side of the line, came a voice from behind her, a young woman on rollerblades. Her voice was not angry, but it was not kind. Olive turned and walked back to her car. At the nursing home, Henry was asleep. With one cheek against the pillow, he looked almost the way he used to look, because his eyes were closed and the blindness was taken away. So the blank, smiling face was gone. Asleep, with the faintest furrowing of his brows, a hint of anxiety seemed caught within him, making him seem familiar. Mary Blackwell was nowhere in sight, but an aide told Olive that Henry had had a bad night. What do you mean, Olive demanded. Agitated, we gave him a pill around four this morning. He'll probably sleep a while longer. Olive pulled the chair next to the bed and sat holding his hand beneath the guardrail. It was still a beautiful hand, large and perfectly proportioned. Surely, as a pharmacist all those years, while he counted out pills, people watching had trusted those hands. Now his handsome hand was the hand of a man half dead. He had dreaded this, as all people did. Why it should have been his fate and not, for example, Louise Larkin's, was anyone's guess. The doctor's guess was that Henry should have been on Lipitor or some other statin since his cholesterol had been a little high. Henry had been one of those pharmacists, though, who seldom took a pill. And Olive's feeling about the doctor was simple. He could go to hell. She waited now until Henry woke up so he wouldn't wonder where she was. When she tried to wash him, get him dressed, with the help of the aide, he was groggy and heavy and kept falling back asleep. The aide said, maybe we should let him rest for a bit. Olive whispered to Henry, I'll be back this afternoon. No one answered the telephone when she called Bunny. She called Christopher. With a time difference, he'd be getting ready for work. Is he okay? Christopher asked immediately. He had a bad night. I'll go back up in a while, but Chris, I saw Louise Larkin this morning. He made no response the whole time she talked. She could hear an urgency in her voice, something desperate or defensive. The crazy creature suggested, I cut my wrists, Olive said. Can you imagine that? And then said, well, maybe that would take too long. Christopher remained silent. Even when she finished with the smashed teacup and the name-calling bitch, Olive could not bring herself to say the word cunt. Are you there? she asked sharply. I can't imagine why you went to see her, Chris finally said, as though accusing her of something. After all these years, you never even liked her. She sent that note, Olive said. She was reaching out. So what, said Christopher. You couldn't drag me in there to save my life. It would hardly save your life. She's all ready to stab someone herself, and she said she knows you've only come back here once. How would she know that, Christopher asked. I think she's cracked. She is cracked. Haven't you been listening? But I think she knows. I think she knows that from Mary Blackwell. Apparently they're in touch. 
Christopher yawned. I have to get into the shower, Mom. Just let me know if Daddy's all right. As she drove to the nursing home, a light rain dropped onto the car and onto the road before her. The sky was gray and low. She felt an upset different from the diff times before. It stemmed from Christopher, yes, but she seemed caught between the pincers of some intractable remorse. A personal deep embarrassment flushed through her as though she had been caught in the act of shoplifting, which she had never done. It was shame that swiped across her soul like those windshield wipers before her, two large black long fingers relentless and rhythmic in their chastisement. Pulling into the parking lot of the nursing home, she turned the car too sharply and came close to hitting a car pulling in beside her. She backed up, pulled in again, leaving more space. But she was unsettled by how close she had come to hitting the car. She took her big handbag, made sure to put her keys where she could find them, and stepped out. The woman, she was ahead of Olive, started to turn toward her. And in less than a few seconds, a strange thing happened. Olive said, I'm awfully sorry about that, my gosh. Just as the woman said, oh, that's all right, with the kindness that Olive felt was providential in its spontaneous generosity, the woman was Mary Blackwell. And the moment occurred so suddenly that neither woman seemed to know at first who the other was. But there they were, Olive Kittredge apologizing to Mary Blackwell and Mary's face, kind, gentle, absolutely forgiving. We're going to stop there. Thank you. But the, the floor ought to be yours uh, for our guests, alumni, and students in the room. We want to allow some time for you to ask some questions, but I, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to offer the first question from an alum. Um, I should say Holly, class of 1982, recalls taking Living Writers back in 1982, and she's very grateful to be part of it again. Uh, I had an interesting comment from one viewer who said that she can't imagine reading this book as a 20-year-old, uh, not having gone through the aging process. and as someone reaching the half-century mark, it resonated very closely with her. Um, but the question comes from a, 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 an, an author in Pink, class of 1977, who writes in from Connecticut. Um, if you have a book in you as an author, um, any ideas how, how a, a, a new author might get started? Would you personally mentor or coach a wannabe author, or where would you direct somebody that might serve as a mentor or coach for a would-be author? Um, I would suggest that you get yourself into a class. Um, am I supposed to repeat that question? That uh, okay, sorry. Um, I, I think that a class, some kind of a, a writing class is the best way to start, um, although it's not for everyone. Um, one has to sort of know their nature. I, I don't personally mentor, but I think if you can find one or two people that read what you read, like kind of have a similar sensibility and start that way, um, that would be how I would start out. Thank you. The floor is yours. Yes. Yes, sorry. learn about it as you went along. I mean, I know the stories weren't written in exact order, but, you know, it's when, when she goes to visit him, right. um, it's suddenly it's like, oh, wow. <laughs> right. The question, the question is, how much did I know about the relationship between Olive and Christopher as I was writing it or before I wrote it? And the answer is, I, it was very much one of discovery. Um, I, I knew that I think the first Olive story that I wrote completely was actually the one of his first wedding where she goes in and, and steals her daughter-in-law, new daughter-in-law's um, bra and stuff like that. But um, so I, you know, Christopher was, I knew that there was that. I, I didn't know as I wrote it um, necessarily that he was going to do what he did. I certainly really didn't plan on him having that second marriage, which was so fun. Um, to, you know, that, that second wife there, um, Anne, with, with all her children uh, that she's picked up and, or had along the way. Um, so, I, I, it, it developed as I went along, but I was saying earlier today um, to the students that it 
came to a point where I had to make a conscious decision whether or not to give Christopher a point of view. There are many points of views in that um, in the book, and and I decided not to give him a point of view because um, it was all of the book. And even though Henry could have a little point of view here and there, I, I you know, I wanted to keep Hen um, Christopher that we would see her, him mostly from from her eyes and the blindness that she had in her relationship to him. Yes? Um, the novel has 13 stories or chapters. Uh, were there any that you intentionally chose to leave out, or did you have to scramble to write any or compose any to put in before it was released? How did you know these 13 would be in? Well, there were some I accidentally left out, um, you know, that I've recently found. But the reason... <laughs> The reason that um, these 13, I, I rented a, it, the book was due, it was way overdue, and, and I rented um, a cottage in, in Provincetown, and I took, I, you know, I write by hand, but, um, but I had to see what I was doing. So I had a laptop without a printer, and I would bicycle down to the wharf to print it out every few days and see what I had. And, um, and that's really all I had, I, nothing except for um, the biography of Graham Greene. And so it was a pretty intense experience that summer. It was really, really quite intense. And um, at the end of the summer, and I had brought with me a few you know, some of the Olive stories, and in whatever form they were in, even if it was just a page at that time. Um, some of them I began from scratch there, and some other stories I brought that I thought would take place in Crosby and that could be redone. So by the time I went home, these were the 13 stories, and that's how they are here. Um, and the order, I kept, as I was working on them, I worked on them at different times, and I thought, I'm going to have to figure out what order to put these in, I don't want my editor to decide, I want to decide. And, but I was actually in, I can remember the corner of the uh, cabin, that, you know, as they got more finished, I'd stick them in a pile, and, and they turned out to be in this order. So I thought, well, look at that. <laughs> and it seemed to make sense, and I thought, there they are. That problem took care of itself, so. so. But there, but there are others that I just, you know, that weren't, <laughs> weren't in that cabin. They were back in New York, so <laughs> there they are. It's okay. Anything else? Where are you going now? What's the next project? Oh, um, I'm about to uh, completely, completely rewrite a great big novel to the point where I don't know if it is even going to be recognizable. Um. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I'm going to do. It's kind of daunting, but, you know, it, it's always daunting. Oh, well, actually, um, a little bit. Um, my, part of this new book will take place, a, lo a lot of this new book will actually take place in New York. Apparently I have to live someplace 25 years to be able to write about it. Um, because it will first, for the first time, include parts of New York, but also parts of Maine, you know, family that goes back and forth. So <laughs> my agent had said to me, get out of Maine. <laughs> but that's not why I'm doing it. <laughs> Just so you don't think I'm controlled. Yes? Okay, so you wrote this book over basically a couple of months. No, I wrote this book over about 10 years, but the, but the real book was in a couple of months, yeah. So you spent, how many times do you rewrite a, a chapter? Countless, and, and that's why it's, it's so hard to, especially with this book, it's so hard to know how long it took me to write because some of them I really did write. The one story in here, I, it did take 10 years to write. Um, and I didn't know that Olive was even alive at that time, you know, live in the page. So I had to rewrite it. Um, I rewrite all the time, constantly, constantly, constantly rewrite. It's just so beautifully crafted. Well, thanks, because it just, um, you know, every word is there because I made the decision to have it there after many. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I didn't finish. That's not the end of it, by the way. But what did you start? With? What was the kernel that you started with, and then 
you talk us through the process? That's a, that's a good um, question. The, the question is, what did I, with the section I just read, what was the kernel that I started with? Um, well, you know, I'm kind of making this up because I can't totally remember, but... <laughs> But I do remember being very interested in the Larkin situation and the mysteriousness of um, that kind of situation and all of being just really traumatized by everything that was happening to her. Um, so I think it was the Larkins. I mean, the story starts with the Larkins, and I think it was the Larkins that originally I was interested in, and then, of course, all, you know, it, be it began to come around that way. Um, keeping their story more in the background, and, and it was sort of as I, I remember as I was writing this, I thought this is kind of fun because like Olive's meeting her match, <laughs> you know, in a way. So, yes. Right. Right. The question is, did I, when did I decide who to make this book about? And right away, actually. The minute Olive showed up. I mean, I had different pieces of stories written around and, and stuff like that, but, um, and I always do. But the, like I said, I think the first real Olive story, complete Olive story, was with the, her son's first wedding. And, and once I saw her and once I saw what she did, I mean, you know, such a good time. Um, I thought I'm going to write a book about Olive. I'm going to write. So you, you like her? As well, I love her. I mean, I wrote her. I love her. <laughs> I do. I, I've never written anybody I don't love. Well, yeah, how can I not? I spend so much time with them. And I, you know, I, 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 I do. I mean, I understand she's not necessarily likable. <laughs> But I love her. Professor, I have one question. A, a, a woman named Katie who works at Webbook or Webook, a uh, matter of fact, her intern is in the room here right now. She asked a question about Olive and the name Olive. Was it always Olive? It was always Olive. Um, it just was Olive. It just showed up. Boop. Big O. Yep. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, I'm just curious. We encounter Olive at the age, at the age of 40. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good question. The question is, um, are the pieces that you know I found in my, you know, under the wherever I found them, and disclose exactly how dirty, messy my, anyway, um, were were was Olive younger? Did I write any pieces of Olive? Young? And the answer is no. And and my my agent had suggested that I do so. She said I would like to see her younger. And I thought, well, you know, not going to happen. <laughs> No, she was she was who she was for me at this time in her life. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned in class earlier you said uh, Henry and Olive's relationship and how you thought Henry was kind of complacent in their relationship, and then how the stroke kind of take, took him out of the picture. I was wondering if you could talk about you know where was Henry you know when Olive was hitting her son and things like that. You could talk about that. Well, it's a question, you know, the, the question is Henry's role and what their marriage was all about. And I, and I think that's one of those questions that really is up to the reader, that the reader will mostly answer those questions. It's not like I um, am, am receding from it, but I think that it's, you know, any marriage is a mystery as far as I'm concerned. These are just, you know, even to the people involved, um, how these things, you know, really, you know, it's such a it's strange territory in there. And... Um, and so I think that it would be hard to just sort of delineate in a few sentences what they, what they were up to. Um, but, but I certainly think it's a valid question that a reader might ask, where was Henry when Christopher was being punished? And, um, and, and yet my sense was that Henry did admire Olive's intelligence and, and forcefulness, but was very much kind of making her up as, as he needed to do as well. And yet, when um, somebody once asked me, well, did Olive love Henry? And I, I, I've always felt, yes, she did. I mean, she wasn't going to the nursing home out of just obligation. She loved him. I mean, love is quite imperfect for most of us. But she was there, so 
Um, but I would, I would say that that is a relationship that that reader will bring their own sense to, as much as I could give any sense to it. Yes. Yes. Could you address the, the light motif of suicide? Um, the light motif of suicide. It's just something that, um, for, for a number of reasons, as as I've gotten older, has crossed my path and been very sad and um, made me curious. You know, I, I did a lot of reading about it in order to write Incoming Tide because I wanted to understand more. Um, I had to understand more what, what that state of mind is like and, and it's, it's, it's just something that I think, uh, you know, it can happen anywhere obviously, but as I mentioned, constantly, you know, isolation I think is always a bad thing and and um, in that sense, it's it's part of this geography, but obviously, it's a it's a it's a condition that doesn't discriminate. Um, it, it was something that seemed to me the the essence of, of of real despair that I wanted to look at. We're going to take one more question uh, from the group here, and then thank. Liz Stroud. One more question. Um, you, you say that the book is written over quite a long time. Um, and I'm wondering, did all of his character change over that time? Would you have to say go back maybe and look at some of the earlier written stories <coughs> and maybe adjust to keep all of one person? That's a good question. Did all of um, change over time and did I have to go back? Um, only not not as I know what you're I think I know what you're talking about and, and not as much as other characters in other work that I've done um, because of the time period you know that I was keeping a rather specific time period in some ways around Olive and and she was Olive from the moment she kind of rose off the page so the stories of course needed a tremendous amount of rework and readjustment because that's how I work but it wasn't like there were some things that I learned about all of that needed to be, you know, re refigured, but not as much as, as um, you know, like Tyler Kasky and Abide With Me, I had to constantly get to know him and redo that. Not so much with all of Thank you so much for all being here.